to all of you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lawrence Bell. I'm the director. Some of you know me, most of you. But I'm the executive director here of the Arizona Jewish Historical Society. This is our house, the Cutler Falcon Jewish Heritage Center. Uh, if you have, has everybody been here before? Has anybody hasn't been here before? Who has not been? Okay, there's a couple. So again, the two-second spiel is that this was the very first synagogue built in Phoenix. Uh, it was a synagogue from 1921 till 1949. It became a Chinese-speaking and then a Spanish-speaking Baptist church. Um, even after all the craziness we've had in the last two weeks, I like to think that this is still an example that we as Americans can live together. Um, hopefully. Although I do say hopefully. Um, in any event, I want to welcome you to this program. Uh, it strikes me as the director here that we've had uh, a lot of programs on Polish Jewish relations since I've been doing this. And I can't remember a single one that I've been able to host here, either ours or yours or anybody's, that's on Ukrainians and Jews. And so I think it's an interesting topic. I certainly know in Jewish lore that uh, Ukrainian Jewish relationships generally were not very good, at least in the Jewish memory of it. Um, but I'm curious to hear what the professor has to say, and uh, I'll leave it at that. We have a wonderful film, by the way, on November 20th. There's some flyers out there. If anybody's interested, GI Jews, a documentary about Jews during World War II, American Jews. It is an amazing film. Feel free to take the uh, flyer. So. Thank you. Everybody. I'm Papa Doros Samuelson, and I'm the director of Jewish Studies uh, at ASU. Many of you obviously know me. Uh, Jewish Studies is both a center as well as a program. So our center focuses on research and on community outreach, and our program offers instruction, various courses that lead either to a BA in Jewish Studies or a certificate, and in some cases also to MA and PhD. For the past decade, the Center for Jewish Studies has collaborated uh, many times uh, with our Zone Jewish Historical Society, and we bring here public lectures, historical exhibits, sometimes films, and we share this venue as a wonderful venue for study and learning. Um, this program also is done in collaboration with the Malikian Center at ASU, and that's another institution with which I work quite a lot. So tonight we have a treat. We are going to listen to Professor Paul Robert Magochi, a professor of history and political science at the University of Toronto, where he holds the John Yarnko Chair of Ukrainian Studies. Professor Magochi is an author of hundreds of works, I kid you not, uh, in the fields of history, sociolinguistics, cartography, uh, bibliography, and immigration studies. His, his BA is from Rutgers University, BA and MA, and then he studied also at Princeton University. He has an MA and a PhD from Princeton University, and he also holds a fellowship, he's a member of the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. So he's taught at Harvard, he's taught at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, he's taught in uh, Germany in the Max Planck Institute uh, for Social Anthropology in Halle, Germany. Uh, and has been a holder of various honorary degrees, one from a university in Slovakia, I believe the pronunciation would be Preshov, is it Preshov? A uh, university in Slovakia, and one from a university in the Ukraine. So uh, among his uh, many books, uh, I won't read all of them because the list is too long, but I'll give you just a few titles just to give you a taste of what he's been writing on. He's been writing uh, one book early on from the 80s is uh, Galicia, a historical survey and bibliographical guide. That's from 1983. Then he has a book, A History of the Ukraine, and I believe that actual book is here in the room. Nancy, right, you have that book, right? So A History of the Ukraine, that's from 1996. <coughs> And he has a book uh, of the making of nationalities, There Is No End. That's a two-volume uh, book from Columbia University Press, 1999. And another book called The Roots of Ukrainian Nationalism. Uh, that's University of Toronto Press from 2002. Now, this evening, our talk and our discussion is going to focus on this book, Jews and Ukrainians, A Millennium of Coexistence, 
The book is available for purchase here. It's $30, and we appreciate the either cash or checks for the exact amount, and we we'll, can handle that after the talk. So let me just say a few words about the book. It's an absolute must to everyone who is interested in understanding Jewish history in Eastern Europe, and especially in the relation, as far as the relationship between Ukrainians and Jews is concerned. I'm going to read you just the opening statement from the book so that you will understand what makes this book so unique and important. I'm now quoting. The book was conceived by two historians of diverse origins. That's a reference to Professor Magachi and the other co-author, Johanan Petrovsky Stern from Northwestern University in Chicago. So the book was conceived by two historians of diverse origins who believe that knowledge and understanding of the Jews and ethnic Ukrainians as distinct people should replace the bias and prejudices through which for too long each people has imagined the other. In order to achieve the goal of mutual understanding, it behooves each people to explore the other as a historical entity and as fellow human beings who are the carriers of a specific culture, body of religious belief, language, and social values. To help in this process, we need to delve into concerns, phobias, strivings, sorrows, and hopes of individual ethnic Ukrainians and Jews. Before we would be able to say something about them as representatives of their respective ethno-national groups. Now, at the end of this magnificent book, and I do mean it's magnificent because it has everything in it. It covers history, economics, politics, social relations, religion, culture, art, education, and daily life. At the end of it, you're going to find the following statement that I want to share with you as well. I quote, ethnic Ukrainians are as complex as people as are Jews, with thousands of viewpoints, patterns of behavior, and modes of thinking. Considering the plurality of, pl uh, of political allegiances, cultural attachments, economic pursuits, and linguistic preferences, there can be no typical Jew or typical Ukrainian. By their very nature, such generalizations result in convenient, yet utterly false reductionism. Hence, to understand the past, we must leave this mode of thinking behind. That's from page 288. Now, I could not agree more with this statement. Today, we face the rise of anti-Semitism and the spread of false myth and misperceptions. Therefore, it behooves on all of us to be committed to factual, accurate, and well-documented historical knowledge of the past so that we can thrive in the present and have a hopeful future. Professor Magachi will be able to help us do this by shedding light on the rich, complex, intertwined stories of Jews and Ukrainians. So please join me in welcoming Professor Magachi to Phoenix. This is the first time I actually have ever been in Phoenix. Uh, this is also maybe only the second or third time that I have been in the southwestern portion of the United States. A, truly a different world. <laughs> a, a world that I am uh, familiar with. And uh, I was struck not only is it a different world in terms of what is already here, uh, but also just these last couple of weeks, we are overwhelmed uh, with uh, the contemporary politics in America because of these midterm elections. <laughs> and I kept thinking to myself, they are tomorrow, actually. <laughs> uh, and I kept thinking to myself this last couple of days, so I was in Dallas before coming here, 
is uh, what are we doing and why are we talking about the historical past? What kind of relevance does any of this have to do with the lives uh, of people who are uh, facing uh, challenges in this country and who are mobilized, at least some of them, to you know, maintain uh, what exists in this country right now in terms of its political structure or to change it? So, so what are we doing here talking about the past and lands you know, terribly far away from not only southwestern portion uh, of the United States, but from the United States in general. Uh, well, I guess in some ways the, the answer to that is relatively also obvious. Uh, we are talking about two peoples who are peoples of history. Who for them, their very existence depends on some knowledge uh, of their own historical past because without that knowledge, then they are not members of those peoples. We know that Jews are the people of the book in any case. Uh, this is drilled into the, the Jews here. You may be using the stereotype of being generalization, but you know, there's sometimes, sometimes validity to this. And similarly, Ukrainians, they're very, they only exist uh, been a stateless people for, uh, for most of their existence uh, because they exist because of knowledge of their historical past. And so it's not surprising, therefore, that uh, uh, we can be speaking about history, speaking about the past, uh, without necessarily this having to be uh, mutually exclusive to the interest in contemporary politics. And of course, uh, sometimes uh, misunderstanding, uh, the deliberate distortion uh, of, of the past leads to tragedies such as this dastardly act that took place in Pittsburgh just a little over a, uh, a week ago. Uh, for any human being, uh, this is, this is something that, that strikes us all as individuals, as our organization as well, the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. May I just ask if we might rise, uh, everyone, at a moment of silence and respect for those people for no other reason than worshiping in their house of worship was slaughtered. And unfortunately, I'm divorced from you, standing behind the podium, uh, literally speaking ex cathedra. I feel a little bit uncomfortable. I would much prefer to have a kind of seminar environment in which I'm closer to you, and I can't even come down. And, and, but I will ask this question. Uh, I, I'm very curious. Ma'am, what comes to mind immediately to you when you hear the word Ukraine? Don't think too much. Somewhere over there. Okay, somewhere over there. So someplace far away. Pardon? The clothes that they wear. The clothes, and, 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 and about the clothes that they wear? You like them, you don't like them? Because some people don't like certain kind of coverings, <laughs> by the way. Okay. What, what do you? Th is Crimea. 
when you hear Ukraine, you think of Crimea. My grandparents. Your grandparents, okay. My father. My grandparents. Yes, okay. Russia. Uh, someone, you think of Ukraine, you think of Russia, okay. The idea that many people come to Ukraine to try to straighten out the government, to have transparency, and it has a reputation, at least from what I've read, being mm -hmm. very corrupt. Okay. A lot of, a lot of sadness. Great grandparents were there. My father's and grandparents were there. I see, okay. Soviet. Soviet, good. Gogol. Gogol? Okay. Kmelnitsky? I hear Kmelnitsky. Kmelnitsky going once, Kmelnitsky going twice. Okay. Pardon? Yalta. Yalta? Jeez, it's going to be a relatively easy crowd here, sir. Relationship with the Nazis. Ah, uh, relationship with Nazis during the Holocaust. Right? Ukrainian SS. Ukrainian SS? Now we're getting, you see, you notice how we started off and now what we're getting into. Yes, please? Anti-Semites. Anti-Semites. Huh? Pogroms. Pogroms. Okay. I, st I said we're starting off easy, but now we're getting into it. Open the step, the open space, like Arizona and Texas, right. Pardon? But a little bit cooler, right? Okay. Okay, good, good. So, thank you. Uh, some of these things I'll be addressing now, some of these things might be addressed subsequently. Uh, this, uh, the very topic, however, that I'm going to speak a little bit about regionalism in Jewish Ukraine, uh, when we started working at it, working on this in the context of the uh, Ukrainian Jewish encounter, uh, raised several conceptual problems. And the first is, can one actually legitimately speak of Ukrainians or speak of Jews as if they are distinct, self-perceived, self-perceived corporate entities in the past, also in the present? Or put another way, do individuals uh, that others define as Ukrainians or, or as Jews, uh, do those individuals themselves actually feel themselves to be part of a group? And also at the same time, do they somehow act in their daily lives in a manner that allegedly reflects and represents a so-called group? whether this group has national characteristics, ethnic characteristics, religious, etc. And then, what do we mean by the very formula or formulation Jews in Ukraine? Or the formulation Ukrainian Jews? Is there such a phenomenon? And if so, then how does one define that phenomenon. And by the way, what are Ukrainians? Are they persons with definable ethnic characteristics or ethno-linguistic characteristics? Or are they all of the people, regardless of their ethno-linguistic origin, who are citizens of a state today called Ukraine. Now, it's always good to, I think, clarify terms that one is using because otherwise, hopefully, one will understand what I mean when I use these terms. So let us adopt the following definitions for our purposes here tonight. Namely, that the name Ukrainian refers to a group of people uh, whose members speak the Ukrainian language or identify as belonging to the Ukrainian nationality. Uh, 
But in general, I prefer to use the term ethnic Ukrainian. Why? Because that then distinguishes this group of citizens of Ukraine from all the other citizens of Ukraine who are of different ethnolinguistic backgrounds and who technically also include the entire population, regardless of what their ethnic or national background is. So ethnic Ukrainians versus just Ukrainians. Ukrainian is anyone who is a citizen of Ukraine, and ethnic Ukrainian is one who is specifically of ethnolinguistic characteristics in Ukraine. The terms Jews in Ukraine, or Ukrainian Jews, first glance seems to be easier to define. Namely, one might think that those terms refer to persons of Jewish religion, Jewish heritage, who were born or live in Ukraine. But then what about Jews of the historic past who lived at a time when Ukraine as a state didn't exist? Uh, and so here I'm going to be using a kind of anachronistic approach Namely, persons of Jewish background in this discussion, of calling them Ukrainian Jews or Jews from Ukraine, uh, are those people who have resided at some point in history on the territory of present day Ukraine from earliest times to the present. And that doesn't make a difference whether a state called Ukraine existed uh, when the Jews lived there. Now, that kind of understanding does not necessarily coincide with, our, with how each of the groups in question has perceived itself. And so there exists what we might call a perceptual disconnect. On the one hand, ethnic Ukrainians consider their historic homeland to have always been Ukraine. That is a territory which in the course of the 20th century finally became clearly defined and eventually an independent state. On the other hand, the Jews in question, for them, they are really part of a worldwide diaspora, one branch of which called Ashkenazim, who had until recently inhabited large parts of Central and Eastern Europe. And you can see that on that very first map, which is handed out, the map, the green map, if you will, that shows the concentration of Jews in Central and Eastern Europe. The darker the green, the, the more intense the percentage of, Ukraine, uh, of Jews living on that territory. And this is a dated from the 1900s. It's called Jews and Armenians, because Armenians already happen to be on this map, in Central Europe uh, in 1900. So we have the old countries of Russian Empire, German Empire, Western Empire. So, and as you can see, there is a line between where the Ashkenazic Jews predominated and the Sephardic Jews, which were basically in the Balkan region uh, and of the Mediterranean uh, of the world. Now, in those cases where some more specific territorial origin is necessary, the general and often vague terms that one encounters to depict the places where Ukrainian Jews lived uh, was the called the Pale of Settlement, was one term that was used, or just Russia in general, and we heard that used here just a few minutes ago, or in more recent times the Soviet Union, or in the case of Hasidic adherents, no geographical place at all. Why? Because for them, the most important thing is not a physical place, but rather the rabbinic dynasty with which they're associated. Could be the Belts dynasty, if we're talking about the lands of present-day Ukraine, it could be the Belts dynasty, the Vladislav, Chernobyl, we have a whole series of these, Safran, Zlotsev, Munkat, Lushin, Sadagora, Vishnitz. And then there are Jews who may identify with a specific region of historic region of present-day Ukraine. 
such as Galicia, or Book of Venom, or Carpathian Rus, or Crimea. The point of this is that for Jews, the concept of a Ukraine is very rarely mentioned as an identifier to describe the origins of oneself, one's Jewish self, or one's ancestors. Rather, the, the, the way it's described is I or my ancestors are a Russian Jew, or a Polish Jew, or a Soviet Jew, or a Galiziana, or a Krimchak, or if we're talking about the these Hasidic dynasties, a Belzer, a Munkacha, all these other variants, but not likely the description of Ukrainian Jew. These various regional and country names do, however, reflect real differences within what we are calling here, defining here as Ukrainian Jew. In many ways, the Jewish cultural mindset derives from geopolitical structures that date, date from the late 18th century to the outbreak of World War I. At that period began with the partition of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So if you look at your second map, you have this kind of pink map, which shows what the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was like, where Belarus is, where Ukraine is, and Poland was liquidated between 1772 and 1795. And when Poland Lithuania ceased to exist in 1795, those lands which until that time had belonged to this former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth were annexed to the Russian Empire and became part of what was known as the Pale of Settlement. So that's what the Pale of Settlement was, as you can see on this map three, which is black and white, and the white portion is, it's those lands of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which were now added to the Russian uh, Empire. More or less the modern day countries of Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine, and Moldova for that matter. And it was in this area, the Pale, that the highest number of Ashkenazic Jews anywhere in the world that lived. Nearly four million of them living in this pale within the Russian Empire. And aside from that, an estimated two million who emigrated from there to North America, especially to the northeastern part of the United States between the years 1897 and 1917, who describe themselves as and their descendants to this day as Jews from Russia or Russian Jews. Now the pale, as you can see on this map three, referred to those Russian provinces that were in the western part of the Russian Empire and specifically in Ukraine, a modern day Ukrainian territory, places like Bolivia, Podolia, Kiev, Chernihiv, Poltav, etc. You see that down at the, the bottom portion of map of three. Uh, and this was where Jews were permitted to reside, because Jews were not permitted to reside in the other parts of the Russian Empire. They, they had to stay within the pale. They couldn't go beyond the pale, literally. Uh, but even within the pale, there were various restrictions on where Jews could reside. And beginning in the 1880s, they were even temporarily banned from moving as first-time residents to rural villages. It was also within this pale, and specifically in those Tsarist provinces located in Ukraine, where the anti-Jewish pogroms of 1881 and 1882 took place. Actually, the loss of life at that time was minimal in comparison to either previous or subsequent pogroms. But most historians nonetheless consider those years, 1881, 1882, to quote Benjamin Harshaw, quote, as a major watershed 
in the history of Jewish culture and consciousness. Why? Because allegedly it was these events which helped to set in motion large-scale emigration abroad and which convinced many secular Jewish intellectuals that the survival of their community must ultimately be sought elsewhere. Whether by going to America or by quote unquote returning and making the Aliyah to Eretz Israel. Hence the importance of those first pogroms uh, in the Russian Empire. Now, despite restrictions and periodic violence, and then again, in particular, another pogrom in 1903 in Kishinev in modern day Moldova. Uh, despite that, there were places within the pale where Jewish communities continued to flourish and even to increase in size. In particular, the case of the Crimean Peninsula, where beginning in the 1880s, Ashkenazim from other parts of Ukraine and from the pale began to settle in large numbers along the already existing Turkic-speaking Krimchak Jews and Karaites whose Crimean communities date back at least to the 13th century. Now, in stark contrast to Jews living in Russia's Pale of Settlement, the Russian Empire's Pale of Settlement, were those residents in present-day Ukraine who found themselves after the 1770s within the Habsburg rule Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburg ruled Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. Just like in Imperial Russia's Pale of Settlement, a very high percentage of Jews were among the Austrian provinces of Galicia and Bukovina, say the Austrian provinces because the Austro-Hungarian Empire was divided into two parts. There was the Hungarian Kingdom, and then there was the so-called Austrian half, which really was everything that wasn't in the Hungarian Kingdom was generally called Austria. Really, it, it did include modern-day Austria, but it included a lot more. Uh, and so Jews lived in very heavy concentrations in the eastern part of the, those Austrian lands, uh, Galicia, in Bukovina, both of which part of which are in Ukraine today. And they also lived in the historic region of Carpathian Rus, which was in the Hungarian half of this uh, empire. And if we turn, if you look at map five, uh, it says the Ukrainian lands in Austria-Hungary, and then uh, you can see precisely these territories that I am uh, speaking, uh, speaking about. Now, Jews in these areas, that is, in the Habsburg ruled Austro Hungarian Empire, were able to reap the advantages of living in a relatively benevolent uh, imperial structure that introduced even constitutional law and parliaments by the 1860s. The, already the Jews were emancipated, if you will, in the late 18th century when the Habsburg Empire first took over the Lysia in Bukovina. One of the very important emperors at the time, Joseph II, the same Joseph II uh, that, that uh, Mozart taught how to play properly. The point is, is that that empire provided legal equality for all citizens, regardless of their religion. And the emancipated Jews there were able to take full advantage of the freedom of movement and settlement anywhere in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, allowing many of them, among other things, to improve their economic status. The more enterprising of them flock to universities, in particular the medical and legal professions, uh, areas in which Jews especially excel uh, in the decades just before World War I, specifically in Habsburg, Austria, Hungary. And in the 1880s, also in this decades before the war, uh, when the danger of potential pogroms in the uh, southern part of the Russian Empire, particularly in Ukraine, Jews from the Russian Imperial Pale Settlement 
sought refuge by crossing the border and settling, at least initially, in Austrian ruled Galicia and Bukovina. Then, after World War I, and in fact, we're celebrating the end of it a century ago this very month, and the collapse of the empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire in particular, and the replacement of Austria-Hungary uh, with the Jews now found themselves in four new states. And if we look then at map six, we can see what the relation, what the political situation was after World War I. And you can see the those farthest western lands, the dark areas where ethnic Ukrainians live, but the farthest western ones we now have the Ukrainian lands and Jews within them living uh, in three new states, Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, and, uh, and Romania, as well as in the eastern part, the former Russian Empire, which was now the Soviet Union. Those in the former Russian Empire were now, as I said, in Bolshevik ruled Soviet Ukrainian Republic. Soviet policies during the 1920s and 30s had both positive and negative impact on their lives. On the one hand, religious Jews and their institutions were persecuted. Petty merchants, retail shop owners were put out of business. And Soviet law lifted all the legal restrictions that had been against them during Russian imperial times, that is, restrictions against them as a group, with the result that hundreds of thousands were able to make rather successful careers in Soviet institutions, whether in government, <coughs> university, scholarly research, or industrial management sectors. So we had both negative impact on Jewish life brought by the Soviets and positive. On the other hand, Jews living in modern-day Ukraine from the former Austro-Hungarian lands, as I said, now found themselves after World War I in Poland, to which Galicia was annexed, in Romania, to which Bukovina was annexed, and to Czechoslovakia, to which Carpathian Rus was annexed. During the subsequent interwar years of the 20th century, the pre-World War tolerance that was exhibited by the Habsburg Empire, and by the way, when we talk about stereotypes, and in, 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 in the past, I remember one, one story that I, that I would want to share with you. Uh, we know, by the way, that Hitler detested the place where he was born, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and when you open up the first pages of Mein Kampf, <laughs> literally, there, all there is is this litany of attack against this terrible Habsburgs and how they ruined the Germanic state by allowing all of these uh, unacceptable types, which included mostly Slavs, by the way, but also Jews, into this empire. Uh, but Sometimes the generalizations that are given and remembered lead to distortions. I have a, I have a, I have a neighbor, my, my, my direct neighbor, or a young Jewish couple. Uh, uh, and uh, one time I saw her coming out of the, uh, coming out of the house in the winter, and she, she was wearing a kind of cap. And and I said, oh, look, that's really, I like that cap. It looks just like. It looks just like uh, someone that would, almost like Austrian military before World War I. And she turned around, it's just a young woman in her mid 30s, she turned around and said, oh, that's terrible because my, if, if my grandfather heard this, he would be turning in his grave. Now, why did she say this? Because she was under the impression, not really knowing history, that everything in Central Europe after the 20th century was terrible, dark, evil. Well, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as an example, when World War I broke out in August 1914, 
And when uh, the Russian imperial troops invaded Galicia, of course, many of the Jews who lived in Galicia, they themselves or their parents fled from the Russian Empire, and now Russian imperial troops are coming, and so they flocked in large numbers into either the Hungarian Kingdom or Budapest or Vienna. And in fact, it was those Jews that Hitler saw on the street and could and detested. But they arrived in large numbers in September of 1914. They had no place to go, and so the emperor housed them in the Winter Palace. Yeah. And the rest of society, you know, the, what, what are you doing? You know, this is terrible. And his answer was, these are my Jews. Because from the Austrian, these are my people. This doesn't make a difference. Who, what? They're my people. They've got to be taken care of. And yet, someone 100 years later, who has no understanding of history, Lops the Habsburg Empire together with the Russian Empire together with Nazi Germany, all that. So you've got to be very careful of the nuances of history. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why one has to study it. Now, what conclusions can we draw from the, and what recommendations why we, we might be able to make on the basis of what I've said so far. Now, the first conclusion has to do with the very formulation, Ukrainian Jewelry. If we're going to use that concept as an analytical tool, then we also must accept the fact of Ukraine as it is today and all its regional diversity and the significant impact that that regional diversity had on the country's Jewish inhabitants. Clearly, the frequently negative experience of Jews in Russia's pale of settlement, which also covered part of Ukrainian territory during the 19th century, is not even remotely the same as the flourishing world of Galician and Bukovinian Jewish life under Habsburg rule in the neighboring Austro-Hungarian Empire. I just gave you an example of that. Whereas pogroms were characteristic occurrences at certain times in the 19th and 20th centuries in many parts of Ukraine, for that matter, in Eastern and Central Europe in general, for instance, one territory in present-day Ukraine, Transcarpathia, that was the area in the Hungarian Kingdom, never experienced a single pogrom or even any other forms of violence, which some Jewish historians classify as ex excesses. A somewhat related conclusion and recommendation is what I would suggest is the need to move away from the simplistic notion that the historic past of Eastern European Jewry is little more than the story of unmitigated tragedy. A Jewish-American scholar, Stephen Sipperstein, best summed up this problem in an essay on Holocaust historiography. This is what he said. In the absence of, historic, in the absence of historical work, in the wake of fierce, definitive immigrant memories about what life back there was like, and in the aftermath of the Shoah, pervasive premonitions of horrors regarding Eastern Europe were conflated and granted a grim presence, or a grim prescience. Nazi horrors and Tsarist pogroms meshed in the often sparse, repetitive narratives that Jews tended to tell about this vast, complex region. The distance between life in Vilna, as he says, the incredibly intellectually productive world epitomized by the Interwar Yibo Institute in Vilna. So the distance between life in Vilna and death in Treblinka tended to narrow in these accounts as if they were just simply differences in detail, not substance. 
Now, to the degree that Ukraine is part of this Eastern European world, the manner in which its very name is treated becomes symptomatic of what Zitterstein is saying, and therefore also a matter of concern. By the way, we heard just en passant the formula the Ukraine. Yeah. Well, that's an insult for some Ukrainians, as one is going to see, and you can look at it in this book. Uh, stereotypes are, of course, hard to overcome, especially when they are embedded in a cultural discourse that goes back centuries. The medieval designation in Jewish sources for the Slavic lands in Central and Eastern Europe, and that includes all of Ukraine, was Knan, a term derived from Canaan, with the implication that it was this Knan the land of slaves. Max Weinberg has reminded us, quote, the history of Yiddish and the history of the Ashkenaz are really identical, even though not in all periods nor in all places did European Jews speak Yiddish. It's particularly struck by another scholar, Benjamin Hashav's discussion in his excellent monograph, The Meaning of Yiddish, where he lists the various other languages used by Europe's Jews, whether from Italian to Russian to English, many others in between. Hasha's list includes, however, one or excludes one otherwise very influential language, which was not only spoken by large numbers of Ashkenazim, but also was one which had an important impact on the later development of Yiddish. What was that unmentionable language? Not in Hashav's list. Well, that unmentionable language was Ukrainian. Traditionally, most Jews referred to it not by its name, as they did Polish, or Dutch, or Czech, but they just simply said this was Goyish. <laughs> and then even within the Jewish world itself, the unmen unmentionable Ukrainian lands took on especially negative characteristics. And this is now within Jews. And what I'm referring here to is the Galiziana. This term was used to describe not only Jews of the historic province of Austria and Galicia, which we just spoke about, but also, at least in terms of Yiddish dialects, the, the Jews not only living in Galicia, but even farther eastern parts of the right bank of Ukraine. Now, in contrast to the superior German Jews, and even though they were Easterners, the more sophisticated Litvaks, the term Galiziana and here I'm quoting the EU Encyclopedia of Jews in Eastern Ukraine, the term Galiziana was a cultural identifier bearing for the most part negative connotations. <laughs> and I quote, a troublemaker, a shrewd operator, a money grubber, a religious fanatic, a spineless compromiser, a speaker of popular vulgar Yiddish, someone ashamed of his or her origin who liked to pose as a Muslim. Uh, traditionally many non galician Jews or Galician Jews. Now nomenclature, as we know, has enormous symbolic as well as instrumental value. Names mean something. And be very careful. Names mean something. And so in this case, the subject of our inquiry should be Ukrainian Jews or the Jews of Ukraine. Also place names, whether towns or historic regions, should reflect the usage in the country where they are located today. It's true that we should be aware of the reality of numerous names for virtually every city, town, and village in Central and Eastern Europe. A good colleague of mine who teaches Central European history 
I mean, he's interviewing graduate students and they want to pursue a career in this area. He, he, he asked them, oh, so tell me the five names. Give me at least five names for Bratislava or five names for Kiev or whatever. And, and he says, if you, can't, if you don't know the five names, then you shouldn't go into this field because you, know, you just have to realize from the very beginning that all of these things are not necessarily complex that you can't understand them, but complex because they're so rich and so diverse. And so we should have respect for present day realities. Let's take one example. We should not be afraid to use the word Lviv if you want, also it's Yiddish alternatives, Lemberek or Lvuv. But it's Lviv, not Polish Lvuv or Russian Lvov. And with regard to historic regions, it's more accurate to say Kiev and Rusya, not Kiev and Russia. Being more sensitive to terminology and its consistent use would certainly be a great help in our common efforts to eliminate unnecessary and at times harmful misperceptions. So let me stop here because I think I've spoken enough and there may be some further questions that any of you may have. Thank you. As a result of that, we have many ethnic Ukrainians who feel themselves fully to be Ukrainian, but uh, either had never been trained 
uh, and educated in Ukraine, or did not have a sufficient, sufficient opportunity to make use of it. So we have in Ukraine today, uh, we have Ukrainian speakers, we have ethnic Ukrainians who are Ukrainian speakers and ethnic Ukrainians who are Russian speakers. And then we have also ethnic Russians actually living in Ukraine. So both languages still exist, uh, but in answer to your question, Ukrainian is a distinct, full-fledged, what we would say, sociologically complete language. The reason I asked is because I found my dad's passport. Mm -hmm. He came from Odessa in about 1906, mm -hmm. and I was curious to know what language it is. Clearly Russian, because that was the official language of the Russian Empire. Okay, because I do have friends from Russia who possibly could, you know, interpret it or... Yeah, it's, uh, it's it, everything until the collapse of the Russian Empire was in, in certainly official documents of that kind were in Russian, just like in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, if they had come from Galicia, then their passport would be in German, because that, it, it, or if they came from Carpathian Rus, south of the mountains, it would be in Hungarian. These were the state languages, just like they weren't in Yiddish, even though they were, right? It could have been, could have been in Yiddish, but they weren't. They would be in the state language. And the state languages at that time were either Russian, German, or Hungarian, depending on what territory one was living in. Okay, yeah, we have one, two, three. Yes, go the ahead. Huh? Can I have the wireless for the questions? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned a section, at least in Europe, where Jews were known as Lufthawks. You mentioned that. Where, where Jews were what? They were known as Lufthawks. Lufthawks, yes. yes. And what, where would that be? Area of that would be modern day Lithuania. Yeah. It would be Lithuania. Yeah. Thank you. I have not read your book. The question I have, though, the title is for the Millennium of Coexistence. Do you think the Jewish experience in the Ukraine or the Ukraine area was any different than the Jewish experience in Western Europe? Good question. Uh, no, no, I would say that the, 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 they were similar in all parts of Europe. Uh, there were periods of conflict and friction between Jews and non-Jews. Those periods of time and those degree of friction uh, varied in intensity depending on what part of Europe one was living in. And so Ukraine is no different than any other part of the European continent. But that for the vast majority of time, during the presence of Jews on the European continent, these were not periods of friction and conflict. There is a passage which I sometimes read from this book which is at the very conclu the conclusion. Uh, and maybe I will, yeah, maybe, what, my, what am I just, it's not gonna take long, but, but it like sums up, you, you, you got it, right? I got it, that's yeah. what you get here, right? Yeah, no, 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 like, I know, you read from here. So, uh, I talk about, I talk about using arithmetic to understand history. I don't know if one usually does that. So, uh, the Jews have lived on Ukrainian land for about a millennium, about a thousand years, stretching from medieval Kievan Rus to the present. Actually, they lived even before that in Crimea and along the, uh, the northern shores of the Black Sea. But as a significant portion of the uh, country's population, their presence is even shorter, actually, so that the large concentrations came around 1550. So put another way, either they lived on the territory of Ukraine for a thousand years plus or 450 years, right? 
So it's either five centuries or ten centuries. But the periods of conflict and destruction that Jews experienced actually only six relatively short time frames. 1648 to 1649, which was the Khmelnytsky era. 1768, which was the period of the uprising of the Haida Marx. 1881, 1883, I alluded to the first of the pogroms. 1903 to 1906, more pogroms, but usually mostly in Moldova, but they spilled over into Ukraine. 1919 to 1920, very serious pogroms. This was the, the era of the Ukrainian revolutionary period. And then, of course, 1941 to 1944, which is the Holocaust. But if you add up those years, the number comes out to 16 or 20 years. Out of either 450 or 1,000 years. But it is to those 16 years that the most attention has been given. Whereas for the rest of the period, you know, don't they have any meaning? Can they not? This is normality, if you will. Perhaps even boring normality, but this is normal life. So again, I think it's very important to keep this in mind. Yeah. But don't you think that that is, don't you think that that's because our generation, um, our parents or grandparents came from, as a result of pogroms, in many cases, and it's still part of our history of what happened. Give us another 50 years, that may not be the case, where people remember it in quite the same way. I very much appreciate people who pose a theoretical proposition and provide an answer. You're absolutely right, Matt. Uh, we just have to wait for a generation of people to move on. This does not mean, however, that one should erase from the historical past these periods, but to place them in perspective, and uh, much in, you have, you, you, you've answered your question. It, it, it's because, the pe and also, also people in general tend to, unfortunately, remember negative things, uh, and clearly not, you know, some Jews left the, the Russian Empire because of pogroms, but the vast majority not. They came because they wanted to improve their economic status. And even, by the way, Small fact, very difficult to even realize is the case. Now I'm talking about the Russian Empire as a whole before World War I. Those who study the history of immigration to the United States, there was an, a, a, something like 2.2 million uh, people came from the Russian Empire in the 50-year cycle before World War I. And of the 2.2 million, we're talking about 75 to 80 percent were actually Jews. It turns out that something like 5 to 8% of those Jews returned to the Russian Empire while it still existed. So if it was so bad, why would they be returning? Uh, these are the kinds of nuances that, that are missed in general narratives, as you correctly point out. But while the general narrative still exists, we need to share with with people who want to learn seriously the nuances of history. Because history, like life, is not black and white. It's just a series of grades. Thank you. OK. Go ahead. My grandparents came from the Ali Khaman, which was in eastern Poland. They spoke Yiddish and Polish, and they didn't survive the Holocaust. And then after the war, there were border adjustments. And I'm sorry, sir. Can you actually speak into the microphone because we're having sorry. difficulty hearing you? My grandparents yeah, came great. from Bialy Common. They mm -hmm. spoke Yiddish and Polish, mm -hmm. 
and the area that they lived in was somewhere a little uh, between uh, La Paz and Turner Paul. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't survive the Holocaust. And then after the war, there was uh, border adjust adjustments, and that, that area became part of the Western U Ukraine. And I'm just curious to know about how many Jews still live in that area, and how many Jews live in the Ukraine. Uh, the area that you're talking about was the first area in which, uh, that is Eastern Poland, the, the first area in, in which when Nazi Germany invaded uh, the Soviet Union, because that area after Poland was destroyed was the next to the Soviet Union for a couple of years. But then when Nazi Germany uh, invaded the Soviet Union during its rapid advance after June 1941, this was the first area that they got to. Uh, and it was the area of uh, Western Ukraine, which you talk about Eastern Galicia, uh, in which the Jewish population was virtually totally annihilated. Uh, farther east, uh, the Soviets carried out evacuation policies, and at least Jews who were able and were already working for the Soviet, uh, the Soviet institutions of various kinds, which I alluded to, uh, large numbers were evacuated. It was only the elderly that were left behind. Uh, 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 and elderly and less mobile, etc. So these are the kind of Jews that were massacred in Babinia when the Germans got there in uh, September of 1941. Uh, but in Western Ukraine, modern day Western Ukraine, precisely this area, Galicia, uh, and Galinia, they were almost totally annihilated by bullets instead of by. Uh, death camps. But after the war was over and after the Germans were driven out, then those Jews who were evacuated, mostly from Central and Eastern Ukraine, returned uh, with the Soviet, the Soviet administration. And that led to, the, the, that then increased the population of Jewry. So after the, after the after World War II, there were about two, there were more than two million Jews living on, in, in the in Soviet Ukraine. Uh, but then, uh, during the 1970s, when the first refuseniks from the Soviet Union finally were allowed to leave the country, a very high number of them, this was throughout the Soviet Union, also from Ukraine. So the numbers of Jews started to decline in the Soviet Union in general and in Soviet Ukraine as well. And then after the collapse of communism, uh, this, uh, this tendency to leave the country uh, for a better economic life uh, continued. Uh, so that the number of Jews that we have today in Ukraine harbor somewhere around 150,000 to 200, to 200,000 again. Exact figures you'll, you'll find you'll find in here. Um, on the other hand, there is uh, there are examples of some Jews returning from Israel to Ukraine, uh, and certainly we know that the relations between Israel and Ukraine are very good, uh, and uh, you know, the context and the ability to move back and forth is it's greater than ever. But Jews in Ukraine. During the period of Ukrainian independence, are acting in exactly the same way as the rest of the population of Ukraine, which has overall declined. Uh, when Ukraine, uh, the, the last years of the Soviet Union, they were, were pushing close to 51 million inhabitants in Ukraine. Now there are 46 million. The population of Ukraine overall is declining, like the populations of many. Uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, it's not the, it's not only demographic change because of, of uh, birth patterns that's also generally declining in Central and Eastern Europe, but it's just this massive immigration of people looking for work. Uh, 
And so, you know, you have a million Ukrainians in Poland or Portugal or England, all over the place. Uh, so the Jews are just part and parcel of the general exodus uh, of, of citizens of Ukraine in search of, of uh, work in other parts of the European continent. Okay, where is the mic somewhere? Oh, the general, there was a gentleman right here who's had his hand up for a while. And over there, and so three more. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that you talked about the 1881-1882 uh, troubles. You didn't mention the precipitating factors um, regarding the assassination of the Tsar and the down the uh, crackdown on the Jews that occurred to the following Tsar. Uh, really made the economic conditions very difficult. Um, do you want to elaborate on that? Now? Uh, you're talking about the period in the second half of the 19th century? 1882. Yeah. 1882. Yeah. Precisely. I mean, the, actually, the, uh, one, of the, one of sometimes one of the justifications for those of the initial pogroms was that there was anger unleashed uh, on the part of right wing groups from other parts of the Russian Empire, uh, in the southern part of the Russian Empire, namely in Ukraine, uh, reacting to the assassination uh, and then blaming this. Uh, some people blame this on, on Jews. Uh, but the economic situation was not very good in the second half of the 19th century in the Russian Empire. And that was the largest motivating factor for this enormous wave of immigration uh, on the part of Jews and not. Well, primarily Jews from the Russian Empire. Uh, some Russians, but today some non-Jewish residents also. Uh, but it was basically economically and it, it, it was not necessarily, it, it wasn't because of, of any enormous political changes, it's just that life was difficult. So people left seeking a better life in North America in particular. Hi, I'm here. Um, I wanted to ask you about was 
everyone knew about the Auschwitz, which was kind of <clears throat> iconic symbol of the destruction of Jewry, but little, much less was known about the what began to be called the Holocaust by bullets of the massacres of Jews in uh, in Ukraine and in Belarus, and parts of Russia, in those areas that Nazi Germany occupied. And as a result of that, both Jewish and non-Jewish historians began to put much more emphasis in an effort to bring to balance the picture, as you say, or, or asking about to look at the total picture of what was going on in Europe during World War I, and not just just focusing or focusing largely uh, on on the Auschwitz phenomenon. So yes, there was a reaction, and we now have a lot more publications uh, and commemorations, which we ourselves, our organization, in fact, contributed to. Okay, one, one last question, and then, and then you will say something. Yeah. Can you pass it? Oh, oh sorry, two more. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Papa. <laughs> sorry. Um, I haven't read your book yet, but I'm dying to read it. Uh, the interesting thing is I, I do understand migration and economics, at least I thought I did, but this is a very personal story. I mean, all my relatives came over in, most of them came over in the late 1800s. And they came, yeah, they didn't have a, they were all poor, living in villages in Ukraine, Russia, wherever, Lithuania. But the thing is, is that I'm not sure that if they just weren't making a, a great deal of money that they would have come if they felt that their neighbors could more like them or tolerated them. Every story that I ever got from all of my grandparents that were handed down from my great-grandparents was that it was miserable. The anti-Semitism was miserable and that they had nothing to lose by getting on a boat and coming to the United States because they didn't own any land or anything. But they were miserable, and so I, I'm struggling with what you were saying because I don't think it was just solely economics. I respond in, 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 in two ways to that question. The first, the first is, is that there were pogroms that took place, and those activities directly and indirectly, because of others who didn't witness them but heard about them, uh, did contribute to uh, people deciding to leave the Russian Empire. Didn't, I would not, nor do we in this book, deny that that is a motivating factor. But the largest motivating factor was as I said, and will still repeat, uh, the economic one, you of course raise a very important issue. Was it just economics? Or was it the fact that people felt uncomfortable living in those small little villages or market towns where they lived because the, the, the comfort zone uh, was challenged by the local population, non-Jewish, which didn't like them and treated them poorly. And you heard from your uh, parents and grandparents or great-grandparents. Uh, I would not 
and could not and should not deny the validity of perhaps the experience of your particular family. I would have the question, however, the value and the, or I would say, the validity of memory that begins with great-grandparents of over 100 years ago and what their children and what you as grandchildren now remember. Uh, we know this from other tales that are told by non-Jews about how they came to North America. The, the emphasis on tales of woe or oppression or whatever tend to stick in one's people's minds more than other motivations. So, well, not denying that this could have been specifically the case in your family, one cannot move from that to make a generalization that that was a factor that affected the largest number of people and, and motivating for them to leave. So that's how I respond to that. How did they get from the Ukraine to England? The train and what could it cost? How could they? I don't understand. Uh, the question here was how did the actual migration uh, take place? How did they get from Ukrainian lands, whether it's to England or to North America or so forth and so on? Uh, uh, well, yes. First of all, railroad. The railroad system in Central and Eastern Europe began to be implemented. Stop and think about this. It's kind of it's more than coincidental. The, the railroads, both in the Russian Empire and certainly in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, were built large in the 1870s and 1880s. So this is exactly the time when immigration starts to happen because people had access now to rail lines. That's a. B, believe it or not, it was actually easier to travel in the 1880s, 1890s, up to World War I, back and forth, and people did travel back and forth, than it is today. First of all, I'll tell you. Uh, first of all, whereas the Russian Empire did have a passport system, right? Nonetheless, and, and tried to restrict people going in and out of the country. Nonetheless, this was pre-totalitarian times. This was a gigantic empire. They didn't have police, you know, border guards checking all over the place. It was some free flow. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, you, could, you didn't need a passport. You could leave the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So all you needed to do was get to the closest railroad line, Junction, sit on the train, and it'll take you either to Fiume, uh, which was the Hungarian port on the Adriatic, or more likely to Bremen and Hamburg uh, on the North Sea. So access, easy. Second thing is, this is exactly the period when the, Ameri the American uh, industry is growing by leaps and bounds. And whether it's industrial plants or mines, they need labor. Large numbers of people. The, these, these large corporations or companies, factories, some had very good agreements with shipping companies. The Cunard Mine and any of the others who were going back and forth. And so for an immigrant, they would leave their little village, they'd get on the train, it would take them to Hamburg, already set up, there was a place for them to sleep until the boat was leaving. They got very cheap patches in steerage because the arrangements between the shipping lines and the factories and mills convinced them that, you know, you fill up the boat with people, they're going to cover their costs. They get off the boat. Most of them could already find jobs real quickly. 
This was a very easy thing. And many, by the way, went back and forth, not once, not twice, in some areas up to 15, 16 times in the period between 1880 and, and 1914. So, especially young men in, from peasant societies, now here I'm talking more about those who could own land and go back and forth, they came over really just to work for a year, maybe two years, and go back, buy some more land, if it, and then if they still couldn't pay off, they come back to America. It, this was what is known as a sojourn immigration. So it was relatively easy, relatively easy for them to leave, and relatively easy for them to get transportation and come to North America. Much more easy than today, literally. Now we got borders. As you know, or if you don't have, you want to build them. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, I came uh, here to find an answer to a question that's been um, coming up a few years now. Um, I'm Ukrainian, and I've lived in Ukraine most of my life, and a part of that life, I'm a Christian who learned that um, Jews are Sorry, I'm missing you now. Can't hear. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, um, for some years in my life, I'm a Christian. I learned that Jews are a God-chosen people, and we should respect them and honor them. But uh, at the same, which is not a problem for me. But at the same time, when I look back and other Ukrainians, I saw um, negative feelings and sometimes even hatred toward Jews. And I'm, my question is, and like I'm trying to find an answer, why, where, what are the reasons for that? Why, what would I say to my fellow Ukrainians who aren't Christian and um, don't fulfill the word? of God the way they're supposed to. How would I explain to them? Well, it's, it, I think it's, uh, I, I, can, I can provide various kinds of answers based on the historical record as to why uh, peasant societies, largely peasant societies, and in this particular case, Ukrainian is one of these, would have had a, a historical hatred for Jews. And a lot of that is in fact discussed in this volume. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the socioeconomic status of Jews used to be Ukrainians and these to be the ruling state, whether that ruling state was the Polish Ukrainian Commonwealth and, uh, or the, the Russian Empire. But when you ask the question, or, 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 or when you pose it at, at the level of why a, a Christian, that's how you're posing it as an individual, is not fulfilling the precepts of Christianity to love one's neighbor and still exhibits hatred toward the other. There's a whole host of kind of motivations that could be behind that for which range from the psychological makeup of a particular individual uh, range from, uh, it can include prejudices that a particular society has uh, been imbued with. Those prejudices may or may not be based on historical reality. Uh, it could include 
just the idea that people are suspicious of anyone who is not of their own ilk. So one could have the same attitude toward, and they sometimes, and people sometimes do to other groups living within multicultural societies. Look at the attitude of non-Roma toward Roma. Uh, There's a whole host of reasons that lead to lack of appreciation for other human beings and then grouping them into groups. As I said, it would be more easy, it would be easier to, and it is somewhat easy to explain this on historical grounds, as this book does, but that still is not necessarily going to uh, respond to how and explain why individuals still persist in the kind of hatreds that they, literally hatreds that they may have. That, that is not an answer, a full answer to your question, and that's simply because I can't answer that question. Now, I don't know who can. I, w I was wondering whether, like for Ukrainians, there might be some, I don't know, things that happen in history, or if, like the reasons are, well, uh, let me then finish this by saying the following. To go back to what I said, I think, is the very first opening statement. There are no, one should avoid even the concept of Ukrainians and Jews or Roma or anybody, as if we're talking about all Ukrainians and all Jews one, we're talking about individuals. Uh, so I think the idea of you saying, well, what do I tell my fellow Ukrainians? Well, I'm sure there are many Ukrainians who, you know, have no, no particular opinion about Jews, right? And by the way, that is certainly the younger generation in Ukraine today. So let's not use the, the kind of generalization. That is one thing that I think we need to get over real quickly. 